Aloha, everyone. Thank you for joining for this month's third Thursday. Our topic for this month is the brief on marine debris. We have two excellent presenters today. First is Mark Manuel, who is the Pacific Islands Regional Coordinator, Coordinator at the NOAA's Marine Debris Program. And second, we have Hyung Soo Park, who is the Assistant Professor at the Department of Civil Environmental and Construct Construction Engineering at the College of Engineering at the U University of Hawaii at Manoa. We would like to invite Mark Manuel to kick us off. All right, can you hear me? You can see my slides? All right, great. Um, I don't want to take up too much of Dr. Park's time, so I'll, I'll try to get through this pretty quickly. Um, again, Mark Manuel, Pacific Island Regional Coordinator for the NOAA Marine Debris Program. Um, and yeah, mahalo for having me here today. I'll be sharing a little bit about our program, um, speaking about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and some of the examples of our work to address marine debris here in Hawaii. Um, so NOAA's Marine Debris Program was established by Congress in 20. Uh, 2006, excuse me, through the Marine Debris Act, where we were then reauthorized and uh, amended in 2012, 2018, and then recently in 2020 through the Save Our Seas Act 2.0. Uh, basically, we're viewed as the federal lead for all things marine debris in the United States and our territories. And so for our program, this is our definition. Uh, we are mandated to abide by this definition. And the main takeaway here is that it's really any solid or human made material that ends up in our marine environments or Great Lakes. Um, so no oil, no hazardous material, no organic material like woody debris and so forth. Um, many of us familiar with terms like plastic pollution, marine litter are used, are used to using them interchangeably, but throughout, through our mandate, we try to stay within this term and definition of marine debris. Um, yes, marine debris is largely made up of plastic items that most people and general audiences are aware of, but it also includes large items like abandoned and derelict vessels, uh, derelict fishing gear like nets, uh, consumer products, straws, utensils, and other really small items like microplastics. Um, this debris enters through various sources, but two main sources that we categorize it by are uh, ocean-based and land-based um, sources. So ocean-based sources could include commercial or recreational fishing, um, cargo ships, cruise ships, abandoned vessels, uh, research equipment, even from NOAA, that could be lost at sea. Um, some of the land-based sources could include littering, illegal dumping, poor waste management, uh, stormwater discharge, ex as well as uh, extreme weather events like flooding. There is a third, technically, like atmospheric deposition, I think, um, you know, through tire particle dust or small microfibers that can be airborne. However, there's still a lot of research to be um, done at really quantifying that true impact and source of marine debris. Uh, with such a large reach, marine debris can have numerous impacts. Um, those include wildlife entanglement, ingestion. I'm sure we've all seen numerous photos of albatross um, stomachs full of plastics. Um, debris can pose hazards to navigation, uh, to, you know, everything's shipped here, basically, right, to Hawaii. So those shipping lanes could be impacted by marine debris. Uh, there's always the potential for a spread of alien and invasive species that can hitchhike on debris from one ecosystem to another. There's the potential for habitat destruction, um, which can occur from large derelict nets or vessels that may be break free from the moorings and ground. And then there's the economic costs, right? And impacts. Um, it costs a lot of money to remove all of this debris. Uh, tourists don't like the aesthetics of it. Neither do uh, locals that consume and utilize the beach themselves. And then there's the impacts to our fisheries, both recreational and commercial. So how do we address all of these issues and impacts? Um, we as a program organize and carry out our work through six main program pillars, as you see here, prevention, removal, research, emergency response, monitoring and detection, as well as regional coordination. And we support 
prevention, removal, and research of marine debris through our nationally competitive federal funding opportunities that really help build our partnerships to address um, our strategic plan goals and objectives. And I could spend a whole bunch of time getting into the weeds of each of these pillars and all the work that we do nationwide, but uh, we would be happy to chat about that offline. Um, we have 11 geographic regions that our program oversees. Uh, there are, is one regional coordinator in each of these regions. I will point out that Florida and Caribbean is now currently split. So there, there's a regional coordinator for Florida, Florida and one for the Caribbean. Um, the rest of our team, the majority of our team, about 28 to 30 individuals are located in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is our NOAA headquarters. Um, so we're dealing with a global ubiquitous problem um, with a really, really small staff, uh, which again is why we rely on our partnerships that we create through our funding opportunities. Uh, so this is my region, the Pacific Islands region, which consists of the entire Hawaiian archipelago. So the main populated Hawaiian islands, as well as the Northwestern Hawaiian islands or Apapahana, Mokoakea Marine National Monument, um, as well as our US Pacific Island territory. So American Samoa, Guam, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. And there's a bunch of other islands sprinkled in between, such as the Pacific Remote Island Archipelago, like Kingman Reef and Palmyra. And then I'll also note that though they're not officially part of my region, we, uh, the Freely Associated Compact States, uh, which include the Republic of Palau, Republic of Marshall Islands, and Federated States of Micronesia are all eligible for our funding opportunities, but haven't officially been added to my uh, purview, you could say. So kind of changing gears, that was a real high level overview of our program and what we're about. I kind of wanted to speak to why debris is such a prevalent and prominent issue here in Hawaii and kind of bring awareness to maybe the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which I'm pretty sure many of you are familiar with and uh, maybe some of the misconceptions about it. So um, the Hawaiian Archipelago is prone to debris accumulation really due to its geographic location within the North Pacific Gyre which is a series of large oceanic currents that basically funnel all debris from throughout the Pacific to various convergence zones or areas seen in this picture here. Um, as the only major landmass within the North Pacific, the archipelago acts as a sieve, basically capturing all and any of this debris within its vicinity, kind of like a whirlpool sucking everything into its center. This debris is from numerous sources, both domestic and international, and has various impacts on our shorelines and coastal environments, which I mentioned earlier. There are various conversion zones, but the most famous is known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, um, which is located uh, between Hawaii and California. Um, I just wanna clarify that the term patch is kind of mis, um, misleading in, in a sense, and it causes many to believe that these islands are, they are this is like an island of trash that can be maybe seen from space or even walked upon, right? Which is not the case. Instead, um, you could view it as like a bowl of soup with a bunch of pepper flakes sprinkled throughout, right? Uh, where debris is, can be found from the ocean surface throughout the entire water column. Um, debris, this debris can range in size and shape from large derelict fishing nets to various microplastics. And this makes it even possible to for vessels to sail through this area or some areas of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch without even seeing any debris at all. And so, as I mentioned, what's, what's the composition of this debris in the garbage patch? Well, there was a study done by uh, some researchers from the Ocean Cleanup, uh, Leverton et al, 2018, and they used various models which were calibrated with uh, data from multi, multiple vessels, aircraft surveys, and they basically predicted that 79,000 79, yeah, 79, tons of ocean plastics are floating inside of this area, uh, which is basically this about 1.6 million square kilometers in size. Um, so really, really big space. Of all of this debris, about 46% of the debris by mass was made up of fishing nets and microplastic only making up about 8%. Um, I will say that there's a lack of research or in situ research within the Great Pacific Garbage Patch area. And those that have conducted research 
um, you know, Al Galita, uh, Five Gyres, those large name research organizations have spent more, most of their time focused on microplastic trawls on the surface. And so we really don't have a clear understanding of what's going on subsurface and throughout the water column. Um, and so what and how often are cleanups and removal efforts occurring within the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? Um, I think it's important for us to first really consider the size of the North Pacific as a whole. The estimated size of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, it's huge. Um, and then the fact that this patch, quote unquote patch, is fluid, dynamic, and always moving. Uh, removal efforts are extremely challenging. Um, and I would say highly cost prohibitive. And so I can't put a figure on how much it would cost to clean it all up, but I would say millions and millions and millions of dollars, right? Um, however, there are groups, a handful of them, that are actively engaged in trying to clean up the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, one that comes to mind is the Ocean Cleanup, uh, which is using like a boom-like structure system to capture floating plastics basically like an oil spill boom that they trawl behind two large vessels. Um, there's another group called the Ocean Voyages Institute that works with vessels of opportunity uh, to tag large nets at sea in the North Pacific with satellite buoys. Then they go out later, maybe a year later, to then target um, these removal efforts uh, by chartering a sailing vessel called the Kauai, which is based out of Hawaii. Um, and then, so where is all this remaining debris go if it's not being cleaned? Um, a lot, we don't know. Um, we really don't know where most of it is going, but I could say that it's probably scattered throughout the Pacific as a whole. And there is clear evidence that there, there are impacts here in Hawaii. Uh, for example, there was a large container ship spill in 2021, the APS-1, um, that lost over 1,800 containers just north of Curie Atoll. Um, in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Uh, debris such as uh, bicycle helmets, Crocs, kids' play mats. Um, I think there was this slime, the kids' slime, uh, have all begun to start washing ashore here in the main Hawaiian Islands. Um, so there is definitely a potential impact of release and uh, I guess uh, the patch spitting out this debris and making its way to our populated main Hawaiian Islands. Um, I'd also like to call out groups like uh, that at the University of Hawaii, the International Pacific Research Center. Maybe some of you are familiar with their work. Um, they, you know, NOAA doesn't fund their, their work, but we continue to work with them on uh, forecasting where and when this debris uh, from acute events like container spills or tsunamis, which I think you're going to hear about later from Dr. Park, or from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and where that will impact um, the state of Hawaii. Um, they're actually partnering with some nonprofits here locally on a publication on marine debris trends here in Hawaii that should come out shortly, hopefully later this year, if not early next, that is actually projecting a pulse of debris to be impacting the main Hawaiian islands in the years to come. Um, beyond monitoring and forecasting, I work closely with NOAA's NESDIS program or National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Services. Um, and to utilize remote sensing techniques to help identify debris like nets at sea or in the open ocean. They basically acquire a bunch of the satellite imagery um, and conduct various analysis to identify spectral signatures of debris like these nets. Uh, this is extremely time consuming and challenging as uh, majority of the debris, as you can see kind of in this photo, uh, is subsurface, right? And so you get a lot of noise basically uh, with um, spectro signatures coming back from ocean or white caps. So it's very tricky. Um, even with sub meter resolution imagery, it's still a challenge. And so they're currently working like many of us in various agencies on machine learning and AI to kind of increase their detection efficiencies. Um, but again, it's still a work in progress. And so beyond forecasting, modeling, um, and you know, remote sensing, how are we tackling the problem here in Hawaii, Hawaii? And this is one of the projects that I wanna call out. So in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands or the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, uh, NOAA Fisheries has led large scale survey and removal efforts there since 1996 through about 2018. And for those of you not familiar with 
the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands or the monument. It's a series of island and atolls, islands and atolls that extend northwest of the main populated Hawaiian Islands, about 1,200 nautical miles or so. Um, and so the focus for these removal efforts have always been on removing derelict nets as they pose the greatest threat for entanglement to our critically and endangered Hawaiian monk seal and threatened green sea turtles. Um, and recently, a nonprofit called the Papahanaumokuakea Marine Debris Project took over those removal operations in the monument and um, sent in 2020, excuse me. And they recently just returned actually from a mission in September that kind of culminated their efforts in 2023. And in, just in 2023, they removed over 200,000 pounds of nets and plastics in just over or just under 60 days of operations. So a really cool uh, project that I can proudly say that no marine debris program has provided funding and support for since the existing of our existence of our program in 2006. Um, beyond removal efforts in the monument, what are we doing here locally here in Hawaii? Well, we've provided funding um, to the Hawaii Pacific University Center for Marine Debris Research um, to establish a derelict fishing gear bounty program in which they're working with commercial fishers, both local and from the long line feet to bring back nets that they encounter during their fishing activities, basically providing them a financial incentive for picking up these nets at sea. So they get a dollar a pound or dry pound weight. And this number is actually pulled from about a month and a half ago. So they've already removed 12,500 pounds of nets through this program. So a really cool project um, working locally here in Hawaii and kind of spreading out into the North Pacific or the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, beyond modeling, forecasting, you know, detection, removal in the monument, removal locally, um, what are we doing um, to address this problem? Um, there's a bunch of different projects, but I wanted to call, call out this particular project that we funded through Parlay Foundation. Um, they're using various preventative initiatives um, and taking underserved, underrepresented youth from Hawaii and these communities nearby uh, to the ocean. It's surprising. You may think that we live on an island and that all these kids are at the beach all the time, but that's completely false. I mean, we have kids that can't even get to the beach or the ocean. And so they're basically taking these youth to the ocean, creating and inspiring ocean stewardship, allowing them to love this space, and then also sharing awareness and education to the problems that impact it. And then bringing them back to this air station that they have at Bishop Museum. So those of you on Oahu, if you haven't checked it out, um, drop by, they're open pretty much every day, I believe, um, where they have various education materials. Um, they have a precious plastic machinery where they chip down this plastic that these kids pick up, turn it into alternative products like carabiners or uh, body surfing hand planes, pretty cool stuff, but uh, really taking a preventative approach to this problem. And then lastly, the, the last project I kind of want to highlight is the Hawaii Marine Debris Action Plan. So this is a plan that was developed by numerous stakeholder groups, federal, state, county, uh, private sector, academia, nonprofit communities, um, came together collectively to build a strategic framework to basically reduce and, uh, the impacts of marine debris here in Hawaii. Um, that 2020 was the original um, end date. So it started back in 2010, it was a 10 year plan. We wrapped up that 10 year plan and they decided they wanted a whole nother 10 year plan. So we're on their second round. Um, but basically this plan is focused heavily on prevention as the key, um, key solution to addressing this problem here in Hawaii. And so they drive the plan, we as NOAA help bring them together, facilitate the implementation of the plan itself. Um, and then, you know, to conclude, what can we do as an individual um, to get involved? What can we do to make a change? Um, again, get involved, participate in cleanups. Yes, it's reactive solution to the problem, um, but you can be preventative. You can go out and testify in legislation that creates change. Um, no marine debris program is non-regulatory, I will say that. 
But as individuals here in the state of Hawaii, we can go out and provide testimony and support those changes. Uh, remember that we live on an island. Uh, Mauka to Makai is very relevant. Uh, what our actions we do on land will impact our sea and our ocean resources and practice the four R's. There are a whole bunch of R's that get thrown out all the time, but refuse, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Uh, we can't recycle our way out of this issue. I will say we lack that infrastructure here in Hawaii. Um, it's a complex issue. It's kind of loom and gloom a lot of times, but there is hope. And uh, again, one thing I like to tell our kids is um, it's a global problem. So we have to think about this issue globally, but we can act locally to help make meaningful change um, in our everyday lives. And so I'll end with that. And um, here's my contact information if you'd like to write it down and I'll be around at the end of Dr. Park's presentation to answer any questions you may have. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. That was great. Sorry about that. I think our folks are frozen. Um, Dr. Park, uh, did you want to get your presentation up? Ooh, his screen might be frozen too. Bye, right, folks. Give us one second. Yeah. Can I restart? Yeah. Thank right. you. Look like you were frozen for a second there. Yeah. Okay. Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay. So I talk about some slightly different you know, marine debris. This is about the debris issue generated from the, the tsunami event in the in the our coastal area. So so just remember that the 2011 Tokyo tsunami, actually we observing the many interesting picture due to the tsunami. So this is a movie at the time, and it, it's the movie recording the Ishinomaki. And then you can, we can observe many kind of debris, including the vehicle, even the house, actually they floating into the inland. So actually this movie goes about the 20 minutes at the end, all the vehicle goes swap away to the inland. So we can expect after this tsunami, we, we can observe many different type of debris actually going to the inland, it causing the issues. So what is the issue? In the viewpoint of the resilience of construction environment, we can expect kind of this tsunami driven debris actually causing the extra damage on structure because it accelerate the loading, like the causing the impact, a collision. And also those debris actually start accumulate in front of the rigid structure. And then it changed the kinematic overflow tsunami and it, it, it increased the loading condition. So it actually eventually accelerate the structural damage in our community. And also like the those debris that transport to the inland actually block the initial rescue. So, and then it actually decreased accessibility and the functionality of the major facility like airport, highway, hospital, and water, electricity supply, they are all stopped. So we can expect many negative effects from that. And also after the mess, we have to recover, we have to clean up everything it causing the extra money. And also there are some hazardous material that contaminate the land. And also we have to dispose of all the debris, collect that, everything and call the money. So kind of reduce and then kind of predict this, this kind of debris issue is very important in our community.
for example, in in the in if I looking at the test area for the Honolulu Harbor, actually there are some lots of study from the A7 or some other researcher provide that the kind of a probabilistic tsunami hard analysis they provide that what's the return period. Lots of type of debris. I particularly think about the shipping container is a major issue because in the Sand Island, you can see this photo. There are so many tons of shipping container. And then if tsunami is coming, this container should be transported to the inland. It collides to the building and it block it making lots of damages. And then we losing the Kind of kind of terminal, maybe we losing that functionality terminal. We have no source to get the the cargo those things, so it's very big issue. Specifically, actually in the Oahu, Kapalama new terminal is actually building now, right? So we can expect if if there is a terminal here in the Oahu, the shipping container during the tsunami maybe unsecured those shipping container could propagate to the inland and then make a damage directly to the our city. Mm -hmm. So kind of this is a very significant issue. So my study is about how to predict this motion of individual shipping container under the tsunami event. And for the tsunami, actually the Hawaii and other state in the US provide that the, this the evacuation map. I think this is very useful for the evacuation. Actually, it provides that what is the evacuation zone under the tsunami event. However, this kind of map does not provide anything about the debris issue because it's just about the flow, flow depth, right? So my question is that we need something different type of map, something explain about the potential debris impact, like the like a shipping container effect. And also for that, we need some modeling study about how to tracking the dislocation of this debris during the tsunami. So for under this under kind of the research question, I developed some work. So this is some of my work methodology to the debris transfer modeling. So first, we can I developed a model using the flow model, like a tsunami inundation model, one of the models using the front wave. So I can generate the tsunami and then adding the debris transfer model and the debris collision model that, that actually allowed to tracking the individual debris. For this modeling, actually we have to give an initial input of debris, like the initial position of debris, quantity, and weight, but their shape, many things. And once we develop debris tracking model, we we okay. we validate this model. So it's a little hard to validate the real scale model. So we utilize the physical model study. So this is one of the, my previous work. We test some debris under the tsunami like wave and then compare to the numerical model. And then once we our numerical model looks reasonable and then I apply our you make a model for the debris tracking model to the our study area on the river harbor about the shipping container. And then using that model, I create a new type of hardened map, especially for the debris. So in this in this presentation, I focus on kind of the shipping this application result. So this is a kind of already published work. So recently I published this, this paper and this paper actually provided the detail about this study. Okay. So first I make, I simulate the tsunami wave for the our, our test bed. So using the some PTH research, so I can find out that 2,500 year event at the 100 meter contour offshore to the sand island, it was about six meter amplitude and 20 minute period. So based on that, I generate the N shape tsunami wave at here and then create some hardened map. So similar model, I can find out that what is the maximum flow depth, what is the maximum velocity, those things. And then this is the map as a sample. 
And then this each simple point, I can pull out the time series of the, the flow depths and then velocity. You can see at point A, B is about the four meter flow depth you can expect from this tsunami. So four meter water depths is the huge and then it is really large enough to transport everything in there, something protocol. And then actually this study actually designed for the shipping container transport. So we, I checked out how many shipping container in our test area in the terminal. So we picked zone A, B, C, D, and then based on the area given, I just assigned a relatively, relatively small number, about 500 to the thousand. Total 2,500 debris shipping containers are randomly just post uh, each zone. So actual number of shipping container is huge, much more than this, but this, this is just case study. We can do it. We can just try for the relatively small number, but actually it's good to show that uh, where they are going under the tsunami event. And for the model, I skipped the detailed part about how we model the debris transportation, but there are some assumptions we made because the Actual, actual shipping container requires a 3D motion. So it's very complicated to have everything. So we assume that the, our shipping container, kind of this 20p shipping container, is the shape look like a disc shape, has in the equivalent volume. So we're keeping the volume of the shipping container, but treat this container as the disc shape, some object, something protocol. And then Using this assumption, I can remove the some 3D effects, so simplify the 2D motion, and then also we give a different number of mass and then solve the problem and the tracking the motion. So this is animation. This is each zone, each color. If a tsunami is coming, you can see that the, these debris actually go to the in and they go to the going back to the sea. And then like it looks like a particle, but this is a really huge, you know, particle. So Actually, this model allowed to model the debris to debris collisions and then debris to the structure collision. But actually, this model does not include any structure like the rigid body structure in the in the ramp at this time. So you can observe some of I can simulate again. So some of some of debris are still remain in the ramp, and some of debris actually wash away to the deep in the deep deep water after the one hour simulation. So here is just some snapshot of the our simulation results. So in generally we can observe that the shipping container those that actually flow through the inundation flow and then go to the inland. But interesting point is that because of channel here the shipping container in the sand island actually go to the south direction because the channel flow actually from the left and right channel, actually they are reflect each other and causing the reverse southward direction flow. So the old sand island, you know, container does not tour to the inland or how they go to the, the southward direction. However, other debris term which locate to the Ohau Island, they go to the Ohau direction. So we can expect lots of damage and problems should be possible there. Especially for the new terminal here, actually there are lots of shipping containers should be propagated to the inland. So we can expect some issue there. So this is my result, but actually the ASC 722 standard actually provided some map to to quantify the, the tsunami debris region, they report that this is debris impact hazard region and the debris DIHR, they quantify that region based on the some spread, spreading angle, 22.5 first mile degree from the debris sources. For example, at the terminal shipping content sources, you can actually create that this the 22.5 first mile you know, angle, and then you can make the shade region up to the three, feet inundation area. This three feet is kind of a threshold value allowed to flooding the shipping container. That's why it's using. So actually the A7 standard say that if 
if you determine the your new structure under the, this region, you have to apply the design code, including the debris impact loading. So this is something their existing approaches. So if I compare this approach to mine, you can see the right figures, the, the yellow, the yellow is the region for A7 approaches, and then new color region is mine. Since my research using the relatively small number of debris, and this is just a one-time simulation, if we, we can think about different direction of tsunami, different amplitude, we may think of much larger, but still A7 approaches actually avoid overestimate mostly. And also you can think about, think about that these A7 approaches cannot reflect any details about debris condition, like the size or quantity and their potential interlocking or some retrofit effect. It, so existing, research, existing this mapping just provide that based on the location of source and then maximum extension. So if you, we think about the possible some the retrofit to minimize this, this transportation, how this operation doesn't work. So kind of goal of today is that I try to introduce some new type of tsunami driven debris hardened map. Actually considering the debris, individual motion of debris. So I want to see that frequency of the debris, debris at specific area. So to, to quantify that, we set up some, the unique grid set about 100 meter by 100 meter, the square in the, our community area. So once we set up each grid set, we actually count that how many debris are passing through that point among the initial from the source. So first map I suggest was that density ratio of debris trajectory. So it's like the each zone you can see some some color lines. So actually green color one indicate that all the sources in debris here actually passing through that route. That means this is a kind of debris route. So we can inspect kind of this the color region. We can inspect more frequent your know, debris collision or collision damming issue. So I can say this debris hotspot is possible. So you can see that each zone have a different debris hotspot and this area could be very vulnerable from the future tsunami debris event. And also considering the, the design code, so we actually estimate the possible collision loading to the structure using the velocity of debris and the mass, and then some stiffness value of the container. This is very simple equation, but we can actually quantify the what's the maximum collision loading at, at that area. So I can plot that maximum debris impact loading based on this equation. And this is some control map. You can inspect something, the maximum debris impact. So when you think about design the structure, your design, the structure capacity has to be great, greater than the, this maximum loading condition. And also I can combine to the cumulative debris impact loading. So like the, we just summed all the possible loading at the, each zone so is showing that it's like the combining the frequency and the maximum debris impact loading. So you can see kind of the, some hotspot is possible. There are some hotspots. So this area is something you can expect more significant debris impact. So kind of this makes it useful because if we apply some event, some retrofit, like if you make it some border, some, some files prevent the debris transport, and then you can actually see that how this map changing. So also we can, if we apply the more precise debris quantity or debris locking condition, actually we can see the how we improve used to this map. All right. So kind of conclusion is that kind of last, the right figure showing that uh, the 2010 Chile tsunami event, at, at the time near, near the harbor, we can see so that some container actually hitting the structure and they caused the damage. So kind of this tsunami driven debris, shipping container, transport model directly track the individual motion during tsunami. And then, as I mentioned, current A7 approaches is limited to quantify this debris hazard and the evaluate potential, potential retrofit. So I suggest new type of surgery debris map based on the direct you know, individual motion tracking. And then we actually observe the debris hotspot and they could be very useful. 
And then for the future world, we actually need more the resources and additional scenario tsunami could be a free cover for the better assessment. And kind of future and ongoing study, uh, the kind of current work I only concern about the simple, you know, simply just the one container, you know, not one container, just the one shape of the you know, shipping container. But there are so many different debris, as you can see with figures from the 2011 Tokyo tsunami. There are many, there should be vehicle, a pole, or some structure, or some wood part, many things. So those those kind of debris should be involved in the modeling too in future work. And also I like to actually test in this model to the other area in Hawaii, especially Maui, Kauri Harbor. That area is really vulnerable from the tsunami and then the terminal is very close to the commercial building there. So I can expect very significant damage from debris in future if a tsunami occur. And also we have to think about the more precise debris information, like how to anchoring, how to stack up, those things very sensitive to the debris assessment for this case. So they should be future work. And then the current work does not include any building environment issue, like the, we didn't model any built built environment, building structure in the in the community. Kind of those buildings actually block the shelter, the the debris. So actual Transportation will be very sensitive about that, but this should be the future world, should be solved in the future. And also we have to do the, some stochastic approaches in the more scenarios. All right, so that's my future work. And then thank you for the, your listening. And then if you have any questions, just let me know. And this is my email. Thank you. Thank you both Mark and Dr. Park for your great presentations. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat. Um, you folks want me to read them to you? <laughs> um, So this one was uh, for, these few are for Mark. Uh, would a strong hurricane break some of it up? I'm, I'm guessing that question is in regards to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, yeah, yeah I, I would assume that any large oceanic system uh, would impact the shape, size, distribution, and where debris is located and where it would be shot out to or distributed. So yes, um, how to measure that? probably would have to ask somebody way smarter than me like dr park or nikolai from uh, iprc dr park do you have any thoughts on on that as well which one um what impact a strong hurricane might have on the great pacific uh, i'm having speaking problems yeah, I think so you in the debris from the storm is possible. Yeah, actually the study is very my model is applicable for the actually the storm surge. And then if there's a water there, it's a protocol, everything could be yeah, transported. So it's possible there. So so yeah. So, but we needed some different model because the tsunami is just one big wave, but storm is like the periodic up and down, up and down. So it's, it's more complicated actually, but storm is a more difficult problem, I think. Yeah. Um, another question, how is marine debris impacted basking behavior for the monk seals and green sea turtles in the main Hawaiian island? I'll technically defer to our protected uh, resources division within NOAA to give you a specific scientific uh, explanation. But um, I would say, yes, there, there is an impact. Um, it's taking up critical habitat. So if you have a large net or uh, structure blocking um, access onto a shoreline for like a sea turtle, 
that is going to nest. That's a that's a prohibitive and bar- a prohibitive barrier for them to do what they want. Monk seals, I will say, they're very inquisitive. We've, you know, prior to sitting in this seat, I was leading uh, the removal efforts in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, and we used to see monk seals actually hauled out onto these large nets out in the water as well as on the shoreline. So uh, they're engaging regularly. Uh, with this type of debris. So there's definitely an impact to their behavior. Um, on that, also another note, sea turtle basking, the presence of various plastics can change the temperature of the sand, which then, you know, temperature of sand dictates and determines sex ratio of sea turtle male to female sex ratio. So again, I, I'm by no means an expert there, but that's just a high level understanding of some potential impacts to sea turtles and monk seals. Well, thanks, Mark. That was a way deeper explanation than I think any of us could have given. So I don't know how high level that actually was. Um, Amy had a question. Is the Bounty program operational throughout the entire year? Yes. So because it's managed out of the Center for Marine Debris Research, they're partnering actually with the Hawaii Longline Association, which is somewhat of a it's not a nonprofit, but it's a group that oversees the commercial longline fleet. And they're working with also local commercial fishers like Rod and Reel that are out there trolling near shore. Um, but yeah, so if they're out fishing, it's open. Uh, the, the, the bounty program's open to all of those fishers. And they're looking to expand beyond like fishers themselves, like ecotourism groups, like well watching groups that are kind of transiting through the channels. Um, so they're hopeful to expand, but our funding is specifically for uh, fishers support. Thumbs up. So that must have been cool. Um, so I think this question is for both uh, Dr. Park and Mark. Uh, how can AI and remote sensing technologies be effectively combined to identify and track marine debris in oceanic waters, thereby aiding in cleanup efforts and environmental protection. I'll take a quick stab just because I, I'm not going to be able to speak to this too much. Um, again, way over my head on this front. But I would say in regards to machine learning, it's only as good as the data you put into it, right, to teach teach um, the algorithms and, and make it function. So we lack data in regards to marine debris. And so from a remote sensing piece, this is where we struggle is they're trying to build a spectral library of the different types of plastics and debris that they're commonly seeing out at sea. And so that's where we're currently at. And so yes, there is, there could be a clear connection on using AI machine learning, remote sensing technologies to aid and efficiently remove debris. However, I would say if we implement that in near shore waters, it would be a, a lot more efficient and beneficial because of the ease of, to access these near shore waters, right? Open ocean, we can detect it, but then it takes five days to get there. That debris is no longer there. So then you'd have to work with your forecasters um, to kind of get an idea of where that debris, item, specific debris item would have potentially went. Um, so that's kind of how I'll approach that answer. So in my viewpoint of the AI and remote sensing for my research area, it's very useful, but uh, for the AI, we need some data actually train the AI, but there are no data for the extreme extreme hurricane tsunami when they be motion. So that's just kind of a limitation, but remote sensing is good because we, if we during the tsunami or hurricane, if we can remotely you know, recording the information, get the data of the debris tracking that those collection data could be useful. We can validate our model and also we can maybe use for the AI stuff in the future. But not now, we don't have much information for that. So there are limitations, yeah. Oh, no. Sound. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, talking and I didn't unmute myself. Um, I'm gonna skip down a bit. Um. Have any similar studies been done of manufactured home parks that are located on or very close to the coast in hurricane storm surge zones? If they break loose from their footings, the effect of them becoming floating battering rams has to be somewhat similar? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure for this one. Sorry. Uh... And Bob, if you are still here, 
feel free to unmute and tell me that I read your question incorrectly because I probably did. Actually, Lydia, you read it absolutely correctly. Yes. Um, we've, we've seen times, especially during flood events, I remember from a tropical storm mm -hmm. where the flood waters went through a plant that manufactured the manufactured homes. And it picked up all the ones that were on the lot waiting for shipment and it sent them down river mm -hmm. and they were just smashing through homes and tearing everything up. Wow. Yeah. So I, I can't help but think of all the coastline area along the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean, where they literally have those manufactured housing parks right on the water. Mm -hmm. Maybe something for some future research and thought yeah. for smarter people than I am for sure. <laughs> um, thanks, Bob. Uh, let's see. Give me a question. To what extent have Tohoku communities integrated tsunami debris modeling into their ongoing reconstruction efforts? I'm not sure for that actually this question. So debris actually issue after the several year of the actual tsunami because we both mostly focus on the just rebuild in the Japan, I'm, I'm not Japan. And then they think about why is the tsunami issue of flow, maximum flow depth and those things. And then and then now people think about, oh, debris, debris also issues. So we actually losing many information about that. So I cannot say some, how they integrate the tsunami debris modeling at this point. But the, as, as we did, we concerned about debris issue in future. If tsunami coming, debris actually causes the more accelerated damage in communities. So we try to predict those debris, like the shipping container and the vessel, marine vessel, or the vehicle, those things. So actually, we are it's the kind of new area we are, we are studying now. Very cool. Um, I think. I think I got just about everybody's question. Um, if I miss anybody. I'll just address, I think there was one on microplastic organisms. Oh. Yeah, but I got you, I got you. I'll answer Thank it. you, it's Dave, David's question. Um, so uh, there are there is in research looking into this like bacterial type organisms that are can be used to biodegrade plastics. I will say then you can basically, basically Google Scholar it and, and find a whole bunch of publications. But what you'll see, I think, commonly is that a lot of these studies are done in laboratory settings. And so in order to scale up that microbial, microbial and enzyme consuming bacteria field to con address the amount of plastics in our ocean, I just don't think those two... Um, scales align very nicely at this point. However, I will say like in uh, solid waste treatment plants and facilities or um, sewage treatment plants, right? That's a common practice. So maybe it could happen there, you know, getting rid of microfibers and microplastics from stormwater or sewage treatment plants. That may be um, someplace to kind of implement that microbial community as a solution, but like at a at, on an ocean at oceanic scale, I think that's where it's going to be very difficult um, or it's probably not the most ideal solution at this point in time. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you folks so much. Um, either of you have any last comment or I look, it looks like no. Okay. So um will we be sending out copies of the presentation that i am not sure about but we will be sending out a link to the recording yes bob i've been sitting here trying to think how to quickly type this question but as an emergency manager i can't help but think the containers are in the container 
port areas, which have to be close to the water, yet we're putting them into a situation where they become part of the problem in a tsunami. Mm -hmm. So how do we go about mitigating the potential problem from them becoming free floating debris without, you can't move them inland because then the ship can't unload. So was there any discussion about elevating the container ports to at least try to get them above expected tsunami wave heights? Just, just a thought. I mean, it, yeah. it just popped into my head, so I wanted to toss it into the discussion. But, but, but my, I'm thinking about that issue, but one is that elevate is the limit because this, this terminal is too large. You cannot have the all area. So I think if we wisely, you know, post the shipping container stack up, maybe we can minimize the unsecure of the debris shipping container. And also you can think about some pole, something the just a, just a, you know, block transport to the inland using some pole. Usually the pole is under the ground, but the emergency situation, they just pop up. So they actually the holding the, they just block the motion of the shipping container. That way we can mi minimize the transportation of the unsecured, deep, unsecured shipping container. But we need some experimental work or some numerical model study for that. Yeah. Sounds like several projects for graduate students to work on. Yeah, also funding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd like to talk to Mattson about. Um, so we're just coming up on time. Thank you so much to our two speakers and everybody who attended. Yes, we will be sending out a YouTube link to the recording um, of this presentation. Mark did drop his contact information. And if there are no other questions, thank you all for attending and we'll see you next time. Oh, I'm sorry. So we won't be doing December, but we will be doing January 3rd, Thursday. So we'll see you all in January. So happy holidays until then. <laughs>